Let me start by saying I'm very passionate about helping people understand themselves and understand other people. Because I feel that's really key, right? This, the beginning of self-growth is self-knowledge. You need to know yourself to know where you need to grow and how you need to grow. And in order to get along with people and really have good relationships, the better you can understand them and the better you understand where they're coming from, obviously makes sense that that helps their relationships and just helps you get along better and understand and appreciate other people more. So these are ideas that I'm very passionate about and as a result I ended up doing a lot of research and work on the Enneagram. So for those of you who never heard of the Enneagram before, I'll just give you a very brief introduction. Um, the Ennea is actually a Greek root word, the, re the root is a Greek root word which means nine. So we have nine and gram like a diagram, so it's basically a symbol with nine points. And if you, if you look at your sheet, you see that's the Enneagram symbol. Um, I don't have a copy myself. Do you have one extra copy? Right. So we got Enya meaning nine and gram like a diagram. So we got this symbol right here and as you see it has nine points. And each of these nine points represents one of nine specific personality types. Um, when we look at it, you see the labels that they have, the different names. The names aren't set in stone. Different Enneagram literature might give them slightly different names. In my own book, I call the helper the giver, the peacemaker I call the mediator, but it's kind of the same idea and whatever name is being used, what we're really talking about when we say the numbers, you know, that's what's set in stone, that this number represents this specific type. Uh, another thing that's important to understand when you talk about the Enneagram is that when we think of the numbers, we should think about them kind of like we think of colors, right? If you're going into Home Depot or Lowe's and you want to paint a room blue or green, right? You, you come to the aisle there and they have these books with the color cards and you're looking for blue and there are literally do dozens and dozens of colors that all fall under the category blue. You got the sky blue and the navy blue and the darker and softer shades and it's really endless almost like you're literally looking at dozens of them and we understand that still they're all called blue and you got the same thing with greens and reds and all that in very much the same way when we think of the Enneagram numbers we're talking about an essence a certain type that something in there their essence is the same but the way they pre present themselves will be extremely varied and very different with a lot of subtleties and it's not like I'm gonna group all the ones and twos and threes together and we'll say oh they're all identical they won't necessarily all be identical at all but if they talk to each other and they share their experiences they will see that a certain perspective that they have towards life and how they approach things is very similar so that's extremely important to keep that in mind. Um, when we think of the behaviors, right, for every single type there are healthier behaviors and kind of the shadow side where you have different behaviors. So of course there might be healthier people and people who aren't quite as evolved who will show the darker side of the type. Um, then we have nature and nurture, you know, where they raised by a different type of number. So that'll have some influences. And then there's something called a wing, uh, which Bela mentioned. And the wing is basically one number that is on either side of yours that you kind of lean towards and that also has some influences on your overall type. So for example, a one would either have a nine wing or a two wing or like a four would either have a three wing or a five wing. And once again, this will add some subtle influences to the type where a four with a three wing actually looks very different than a four with a five wing. In this specific case, the, the four with a three wing would be like a little better dressed, a little more poised, a little more outgoing, and the four with a five wing will typically be more reserved and present themselves a little differently. So just to give us you know, an idea that we're talking about numbers, it's, it's not all identical, but what we're going to try to really identify is the essence of that type and what it is that it represents. Um, so that was the brief intro. Um, and Okay, so let's put that aside for a second. Um, what I also want to say is that with what my goal here really is today, I'm going to share today three specific principles and one concluding idea. 
Now, these principles and this concluding idea are really like self-growth principles on their own, independent of the whole Enneagram personality system. So I'll present each one, we'll discuss it, and then I'll turn to the Enneagram and I'll say, how does that apply to the Enneagram personality system? So if you're here and you're not so into personality types and maybe you're, you, you think they'll confuse you or whatever, it's fine. You can just focus on the principles that we're talking about and that'll be okay. You don't have to get into that. If you are waiting eagerly, like I know some of you are, to get a little more familiar with Enneagram, you'll have those principles and the Enneagram information itself, so you'll walk away with that. So, and, and an, an important disclaimer also is that in the time that we have here, it's impossible to really get into all the subtleties of the system, so you might walk away, maybe you'll misidentify yourself, maybe you'll feel that you can connect to three different types, and that's okay. My point is not to make sure that you're all completely educated about the Enneagram system. My point, is, my, what I'm really here to do today is to help you gain a better understanding of yourself as you hear about different personality types, it kind of opens our minds a little bit just to understand different perspectives, why different people might be doing different things, and it just helps us understand people better. So if you walk away today with a better standing of yourself, better standing of others, more love for yourself, more love for others, and some practical self-growth ideas, then we'll have achieved our goal. So that's what we're looking for. But imagine if I walk away thinking less of other people. <laughs> Shalom. Then I will. <laughs> that won't happen. We will try very hard that that won't happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll talk about that. Absolutely. That's the goal. That's the goal. All right. So let's start with principle number one. Okay. What I'd like you to do is, I believe you all have your notepads and pens, right? Um, if not, I hope you find, maybe your, your neighbor can give you paper or you can write somewhere. Because um, we will be writing a few sentences through. Um, besides for that, do you have extra piece of paper where you can just use like as here? Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, if you can write the following sentence. I often get so, I, no, not often, let's say sometimes. Yes? I think it's better if you speak without the mic. Is that okay? No, okay. I don't think so. I think you want to try it. Yeah. Just put the mic down. Do you want me to put the mic down? Yes. Uh, is that okay? No, put so, the mic down a little bit because it sounds a little bit One second, I have to ask. Is it not clear? What? I think so. Like this? Is this okay? Is this okay? Yes. Okay, because he was saying I need to hold it to my, okay, so you'll let me know, thank you. Um, thank you for letting me know, all right. Okay, so you're going to write the following sentence. I sometimes get annoyed that blank is so blank. Okay, I sometimes get annoyed that blank is so blank. Now your first blank can be any person in your life. It can be a spouse, a child, a coworker, an employer, a neighbor, a family member, whoever you'd like. And the second half is any trait, any trait at all. So I, I sometimes get annoyed that blank, this person in your life, is so blank. Any trait that might be annoying you. And if you want, you can do an initial or whatever so we don't know who it is. Um, okay, that's sentence number one. You want us to fill it in now. Yeah, 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 fill it in now. I, 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 exactly. I sometimes get annoyed that blank, write the specific person, is so blank, and write the specific trait that sometimes annoys you. Okay, B. Your second sentence is, I'm proud of the fact that I'm generally blank. And just, uh, I'm proud of the fact that I'm generally blank. And that's a positive character trait, something that you feel good about, that you know about your personality, that you know about yourself. Okay, now I want you to go back to your first sentence, the one about the annoying person who has an annoying trait. And I want you to try to see, when you look at this negative trait, can you Take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what this trade involves. And can you find a positive flip side to this trait? For example, you said the person is lazy, right? 
can you see that the same part that makes this person lazy also makes them really super easygoing? And that's something that's nice, right? Okay, just whatever it is, whatever trait you have, look at the trait and try to think, is there a positive flip side to this specific trait? I'll give you, do you need, a, do you need another example? What? You tell me. Think about it. Think about it. So if you think that it has no positive, if you think that it has no positive, it means you have to work harder to find it. Work harder to find it. Work harder to find it. That other person's trait. So we're not talking about does it register or not. Is there a positive flip side to that trait? I'll give you one more example. I'll give you one more example. Say that you said that the person is really rigid. Okay? It's annoying to work with a person who's really rigid, right? Can we agree with that? It's annoying. What? Then they're very efficient. Exactly. Thank you. She said then they're very efficient. I was going to say responsible. A lot of rigid people are very dependable. You know you can rely on them. They're going to get it done. So we're not excusing the fact that they're rigid and we're not dismissing the fact that they're rigid and annoying. That is true. We're not saying the statement isn't true. We're saying is there a positive side to that? What is someone Someone who, okay, let's go to the next one. Your, your second statement, if you could identify something that you feel good about yourself, right? Can you see, and, and now it's good to know our good parts, right? It's very empowering and it's important. We need to have self-knowledge and know what are our strong points and how we can actualize and use that in our life. It's great. But if we're going to be very honest and assess that in a bigger picture view, can you identify in yourself a negative flip side to the positive trait that you wrote down. Because you have that positive side, it actually has a shadow side. Now, some of you look a little bit older than 20, so maybe you've worked on it, and that negative side is not true. Maybe it was true in the past, and maybe you've conquered it, right? We're not making judgments like, does that come out every day, does it not? That's not the point. The point is, can you see, can you recognize that within that positive, there is a negative flip side? Right. Do you wrote that as your positive? Yeah. Do you think there's ever a time when you need to speak up and you don't? Right. Right. But I actually find it interesting that some of you seem to have an easier time with a second one where you were able to see that the positive trait might have a negative flip side and yet when someone is so annoying and that negative trait is like in our face all the time and really turning us off, we have sometimes a harder time admitting that, you know what, there might be a positive side to that, right? So maybe if you're super loyal, maybe you're also very unforgiving if someone betrays you, right? We can see with that. If someone is very easygoing, right, maybe they're a little lazy. If they're super ambitious, maybe sometimes they're a little bit workaholic, right? We see how that works. Now, yes, let me hear. Passionate, okay. But do you see how sometimes you have to really get creative? But there is something there. There is something there. Can I ask you each to share with the two women on either side what it is that you wrote and what the flip side was? Just so that we get more of an idea of this concept, okay? With the two women on the two sides, just tell them what you wrote.
short in time, so hopefully you got to do some sharing, and we'll move on from here. <laughs> So it's very normal when we get annoyed with someone, right? <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you got more clarity about this idea. Raise your hand, did you get more clarity? Yes, raise your hand. Did you get some more clarity by sharing? Okay. All right, can we see when we have a negative trait before us, we tend to get a little hyper-focused on it, right? And it's harder to see the bigger picture. Right, yes. It seems like some people still need to... So specific, let's write down this principle. Principle number one. Principle number one, you can put this on your sheet. Oh, yeah. All right, you can put principle number one on your sheet. With it, there is greatness. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, I see everyone's, it, it, it's, it's a concept that, right, down here, okay, all right, so you can fill in your sheet, you can write, there is greatness within every trait, the, there is greatness within every trait, no, it's not, okay, there is, but it's not, Principle number one, there is greatness within every trait. You don't hear? Can you hear now? Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Do you hear now? Can you hear in the back? Do you hear? Okay, so I guess it has to be really quiet in the front for those of you in the back to hear. Okay, moving on. So principle number one was there is greatness within every trade. Now this is something that's so important to understand because when we, you're still? I don't know. Can you hear now? Speak without it for one second. Speak without it and then we'll make it. Alright, so basically when we when we when we when we when we Okay, here you're back. Okay, try that one. Okay. Thank you. Alright. Sometimes we have this um Okay, oh, perfect. Okay, good. All right. So sometimes, you know, we get annoyed at someone and we get hyper focused on that trait that's annoying us. And when we can live with this idea that every trait has a flip side to it that's positive. Now, it doesn't mean that the negative trait doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean that the negative trait will never annoy us and, and won't be a problem. It might be. But when we can have the bigger picture view in mind and we can recognize that. There's a flip side to this that's positive. It can help us tolerate and accept the other person a little bit more easily. And raise your hand if by any chance the flip positive side of the negative trait from the other person was actually one that you might be able to work to emulate. Right? Isn't that interesting sometimes? Right. Now, as far as when it comes to ourselves, our own self-growth, Sometimes we get a little, um, let's call it infatuated with our own positive traits. And we kind of get lost in this idea that I'm so amazing because I'm so organized. I'm so amazing because I am deep, unlike all those other shallow people or whatever it is. 
the same idea, we can have a little more balanced view of ourselves when we can be aware. It doesn't mean that we're living in our shadow side, hopefully we're not, but just to have that awareness that it exists within us is super helpful. And then for those of you here who might be parents or educators, it's so important when we're dealing with people to understand those two sides. Sometimes we get stuck with the stereotypical good student, right? The goody two shoes, the perfect model, Basiakov student, how she must look like. And we forget that there are all these different personality types, and maybe some of them are showing their darker side to you now. But when you can look at them and recognize what's the positive flip side here, you, you have so much, you can empower them at a, in a whole different level because you're not just trying to imagine something, you're recognizing something that's truly there. And when you can bring that out and help the child see it in themselves, it's extremely powerful that you can do that. So however it is, it's so important always to recognize traits are, there, there are bad traits, but there's really, it's neutral. At the end of the day, there are neutral traits that have two sides to them. And that's a very powerful idea of the Enneagram, that as we go through the different Enneagram types, we can literally see how that one type of person has these two such different sides to themselves. So let's explore it here. And again, you know, if someone is a very healthy person, they will spend more time on the positive side. And if not, maybe they'll show more of the shadow side, but they're both there. And that's what's important to remember. So um, you can turn over the page where we have the boxes of the types. And I'll give a very quick overview now, and then we'll get deeper into it when we talk about the second principle, okay? So type one is the reformer. If you look at the adjectives here, they start with productive, efficient, idealistic, fear, honest, right? All those other great things. And we can think, wow, such a great person. Like, where can you ever go wrong? But then, you know, towards the end of the list, you can see self-righteous, condescending, intolerant. And basically what type one is, is a person who wants to be good and wants to do good and wants to bring good change to the world. The world. That's where the word reformer comes from. They like to change things around them and bring good to the world. Now, generally speaking, that's a wonderful thing. But when you want to bring change, it's because you see the negative, And sometimes you can get too critical and opinionated and rigid and things like that. So you can see how you can really see both in the person. They're actually super efficient, very responsible, great organizers. A lot of them are leaders because they really know how to get things done and they get it done well. They're organized. And um, so, you, so you see, that's the general. We'll just look at the general traits now and we'll go more into depth uh, principle two. Type two is the helper. This is a person who's ge generous, loving, warm, cheerful, helpful, typically have a smile on their face, um, you know, very likable, very friendly. And then you see towards the end, they get people pleasing, they get manipulative, meddlesome. So you see you have the two flip sides for the person. Type three, the achiever. We'll, we'll, move, we'll move on and you'll see. Okay, type three, the achiever. So we have a person that's confident, hardworking, driven. They're very success oriented. They're naturally poised. They present them, them, themselves well. They're typically well dressed, um, wearing the right brands, like to drive a nice car. You know, that kind. they want to be successful. They typically are successful because they know how to work hard and they look successful too. Um, and the, on the flip side, you can see how they might get so hung up on being successful that you know, they'll become dishonest or they're superficial. It's all the act. It's all, you know, the poise on the outside. So there's, again, the two sides to that. Four is the individualist, a person who's expressive, creative. They're typically um, artsy kind of people. They might be um, painters, songwriters, um, you know, like to play music, anything like that. They might not, not necessarily in a professional way, actually. Um, I, a lot of fours really like to do whatever artistic uh, you know, abilities they have. They like to do it as a way of exploring their own personal world, not necessarily as a way as a profession, um, but they are all very emotional people and they love to explore their inner world and understand their inner world. And then you got the other side where they can get depressed or moody, self-absorbed, and you see there's the two sides to that. Type five is the observer. This is like, you know, the classic um, inventor kind, scientists. They love to observe things, understand how things work. They have a lot of patience and incredible focus to just, you know, try to solve a really complex math problem for a really long time or things like that. Um, so you see they're curious, they're objective. Objective is in the way they look at things, like they can really see both, like they don't take 
And just because someone said something, they don't take it for granted. They really can take a step back and see the whole picture objectively and decide for themselves, is this true, is this not? Is there a better way to do it? So um, they're curious, they're persevering, right? Because they'll stick to it for a long time, they're knowledgeable. And then you see on the other side, they can get withdrawn, they can get stubborn, detached, and things like that. Type six is the loyalist, very loyal, likable personality, very helpful, um, very co committed to, um, um, you know, the shul niche, to the kids' school, to the community, to whatever, type six, the loyalist. So they're very committed to the family group, to the company they work with, to the community they belong to, the social circle. Um, that's very important to them, to them, so they're loyal in that kind of way. Um, and the other side, they also have a lot of anxiety, so they get anxious and suspicious, paranoid, and they tend to be rigid, so that's their uh, flip side. But super committed and things like that. All right, type seven, the enthusiast, this is a very fun-loving, outgoing, spontaneous type. Very generous, confident, big-hearted. Um, and then on the other side, they get very scattered, impulsive, distractible, things like that. Now we got type eight, the leader. Very dependable, loyal, the leader. This is a very strong, confident type. Um, very direct speaking style. So we have the word direct there. Um, you know, they're the straight talker. They do her, they get things done. Um, amazing leaders, protective, they're very protective of whom they consider their people. On one hand, they have a very direct speaking style, so some people might feel a little intimidated, but on the other hand, if they're, let's say, head of a company or head of a, you know, yeshiva or whatever, like their people, they're like the mama bear that shows the claws, but they're going to go all out for their people that they want to protect. Um, very, you know, knowledgeable, they're real, um, I'm sorry, determined, decisive, right? And then they get, they can be intimidating because they're so direct, they can be controlling, they can be domineering, they can be insensitive and aggressive. That's their shadow side. And then we got type nine, the mediator or the peacemaker, and they're very easygoing, patient, receptive, accommodating, diplomatic. They'll do, they'll give in very easily. You want this, no problem. You want to go first, you want to go second. You know, they'll just agree. Very agreeable, um, very self-effacing. And then on the other hand, they can get a, forgetful, lazy, passive aggressive, and things like that. Um, and just so that you get a little bit of an image like in your, in your heads to understand the types, I would say um, if we're talking about like lo strong leadership skills, what? Again? What more than one? So, oh, no. A a Oh, I, I heard the question now. If there, if you can be more than one type, right? So it's possible that you see yourself in more than one, but typically there's one that's really the essence. And when we get to the desires, you'll get that a little better. But um, but you might have different pieces in you, but there's really one where you start. Um, but just to give you a little bit more of a visual, I would say that like um, the ones, three, and eights are usually leaders because they're strong and decisive and they get things done. Of these three, um, three the achievers, the one that will appear the most poised. Eight is more like strength, right? They have power. They're in a room, you can feel their presence is there. The seven is another number that also like has a strong presence, but it's more like um, not so much in a leader efficient organized kind of way they're more like these big people with big hearts and you they come into a room and you know they're the life of the party so the sevens and eights would have a strong presence one three eight would be good leaders um, fours and fives and nines are the ones that are most like reserved fours are in their emotional world fives are in their intellectual world um, the loyalist the interesting thing about two and six Two and six are two numbers that might be super efficient, super organized, super intelligent, and yet they do not like to be in the leadership position. They're, so they like they, they want to be like let's say type two might be the assistant to this you know world known director or something, or six might be like don't make me make all the decisions. I don't want to have the final world the word. You make the decisions and I want to help. So a lot of twos and sixes um, prefer the second to command. And again, everything that I'm saying, it's not like there's no exception anywhere in the world, but this is very common and very likely. Um, okay, let me go to principle two where we'll talk more about the desires and that might help you with that. All right, principle two. 
All right, I want you to write down the following sentence. Okay, I, I see some of you have questions, and I really feel like after we'll do principle two, a lot of it will get answered, and then I'll take other questions. So we're going to talk about principle two. Now, I want you to write down a sentence, not as principle two, but now in your, if you have a scrap piece of paper, okay? I always, yeah, principle one, did you write that down yet? Yeah, principle one, what goes on the sheet, right, okay. Okay, I'll give you principle one one more time for those that didn't write it down yet. Principle one is, there is greatness within every trade. There is greatness within every trade. That went onto your sheet for principle one for those of you that missed it. Okay, now I'm giving you a sentence. They were catching up. Okay, now this is a sentence not for your sheet, just for yourself. I always want to try to blank. What is something in life that you pursue? I always want to try to blank. It doesn't have to be positive or negative or neutral. It could be anything at all. I always want to try to, um, you know, eat healthily. I, I try to impress people. I, I want to exercise regularly. What, whatever it is that you want, either positive or negative or neutral. Just finish the sentence. No, just fill in one. No, just anything that you that you pursue in life. Okay, got that? Anything in life. Ladies, if we could just keep it down a little bit so we could just get all the, um, from. and if there's a question, maybe someone should just raise their hand, but just so we could be able to keep. Yes. I, I, just, I, I just have a question for you. I, all of the nine types that you described, um, me and Kaya, um, so we, we see the flips. Okay. Excluding six. We do not see how the positives of the loyalists right. get to the negatives of the flips. Like, we were reading all of them, and thank you so much for explaining this, it was amazing. But we, you lost us when we were, we're like, we don't see that one. Okay. Can you explain to us why? Yes, I'm going to do that in a minute when I'll talk about the desires. Okay. So give me a minute, we'll, we'll get to that in two minutes. Okay. okay, thank you for the question. Okay, so I think a lot of questions are going to get answered. So let's try to keep going, and then if you'll still have your questions, I'll take them soon. All right, so for this sentence was, I always want to do what? You know, something that you pursue in your life that's important for you. You invest time in it, you invest effort in it. It's a value that you have, something that's important to you that you pursue. You got that, right? You put something down. Okay, now when you look at this, what is the fallout? Is there any fallout to the fact that you are pursuing this maybe in a very single-minded way, maybe you're investing a lot of time in it? Is there any fallout? And let me make it clear, number one might be something holy. It might be something special. It might be something good. Maybe you put down something negative, I don't know. But even if you put down something good, do you see any fallout there? Um, maybe when you do that, you're neglecting another important thing. Or maybe when you do that, um, you're forgetting something or whatever. Any, is there any fallout at all? And you can put down what that is. So for principle number two, Principle number two is a reminder. Let's write it down first on the sheet and then I'll explain it. Principle number two, we'll put it on the sheet. Let go of desperation to achieve your desire. Let go of desperation to achieve your desire.
there's too much desperation there. It will remain beyond your grasp. And that's a very essential idea to the Enneagram. And we'll go through the numbers and I'm going to explain it to you. And I think it might answer some of the questions that you had. Um, so, you, so the point is to understand why are you doing something, um, you know, and where, where is it taking you and what happens when you want it too badly. That's really the point that we're talking about. So um, let me just take the sheet that you all have. Um, in, in my book, I, have, I call this the feudal chase, and as an image for it, I have a picture of a dog chasing its tail. And that's really the image that it is, right? The dog is, the dog is chasing the tail. There is so much effort being invested there. He's exerting so much energy, but the tail just keeps remaining beyond his grasp. And with all the Enneagram types, this is the, a similar idea where every type has a unique desire. This is the desire that drives them. And in fact, all the traits that we looked at over here are just a result of the desire. And it's, it's extremely, th this is actually why I love the Enneagram because I find that a lot of personality types, uh, systems, I know if any of you are familiar with Myers-Briggs or things like that, usually they focus on the what. What does the person do? What do they look like? They're extroverted, they're introverted, they're intuitive, they're sensitive, right? Like, how do they look at the world? The Enneagram has an added layer to that, where they are not just, this is the what, what we looked at here in the box, and then they have the deeper layer, which is why. Why do you do what you do? Not just what are you doing, why are you doing it? And that's your desire, the desire that drives you. And the desire is a good thing. It takes us to good places, but when we get too desperate with it, our, what we're desiring, our goal that we're chasing will remain beyond our grasp. So let's explain the desires because that's really the essence of the type, okay? So you see where I have the desires. Okay, ones, ones desire to be good, to be deserving of the approval of others, and to improve themselves and the world around them. This is their life's mission, right? Every desire that we're gonna look here, it's kind of like the person's life mission. I want to be good. They are the obedient students. They're going to follow the rules. They get to the zoo, they're gonna check out the sign. You may, may not feed the animals. May I, may I not? Like, what do I need? Like, they really wanna know what do I need to do and they want to be good. At the same time, they want others to see them as good too. So they might have this tendency to over-explain themselves to others. Oh no, I don't usually eat this hechsher, but now I'm on vacation and you know, only then do I do it. And other ones are like, I don't care. Eat whatever you want to eat. But they feel this need to explain themselves because they want others to see them as good. So if they're making certain decisions that maybe others aren't even questioning, but they kind of want to protect themselves, so they explain it. They live with a lot of shoulds. You should do this, you should do that. That's the, we're still talking about one. Um, and then they, they want to improve the world around them. So improve the world around them. You can, like we said before, like about the shades of color. They might be into like teaching people how to budget that you must live fi you know, responsibly, financially. They might be into healthy eating. You have to eat healthy foods, don't eat chemicals. They might be into people should know about eating the right um, foods as far as halakha is concerned, a heksha or watch out for worms or whatever. They might be into animal rights. They might be into education. They might be into anything at all, but if you're a one, you have things that you advocate for, things that are important to you. Maybe you're doing it in a leadership, maybe you have a leadership position and you're doing it on a bigger scale. Maybe you're doing it just for yourself in your own home, but there are things that you're passionate about that you are committed to, that's just part of the type. So how do we go from being this wonderful person who wants to do good and change the world in a good way and you know make have a positive influence on the world around them to the negative part how do, why wouldn't the one reach their desire so let's take the example of a woman who is very committed to eating healthily and educating people about the harm of chemicals and foods, right? So there could be one woman, she has maybe an Instagram page and she takes pictures of the breakfasts and dinners that she makes and she posts it and people ask questions and she says, yes, this is why she's choosing this, this is why she's choosing that. And she's educating others and influencing 
the world about something that's important to her, right? Then there's another woman, and she lets everybody know how important it is to eat healthy, and why are you even holding that in your hand? You know what chemicals are in there? And then there's a first grade sitter play, and she comes to the play, and she looks at the table where all the mommies bought the food, and they're like, I can't believe the stuff on this table. Do you see what the mothers bring? Look at that. These cake, and don't they know what's inside the jelly beans? And they'll go over to the teacher and say, get this food out of here. Why is the food here? Now let's try to think. The second woman is going about her mission with a lot more passion and, can we say, desperation, maybe, right? Which of the two is making a bigger impact? One. The first one, right? Can we see when this other woman starts talking, everyone's rolling their eyes and like, okay, whatever, healthy food, next case. Right? Nobody is getting influenced by her. So what she has wanted to achieve, her desire was to make an impact on the world and a good, she wanted to bring good to the world. She wanted other people to look at her that she's a good person. But instead, they're rolling their eyes at her. They're not interested in taking any influences. So don't, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to put on the table. Because they're turned off by the fact that she's so critical and pushy and rigid and opinionated. Now, the same one with exact same passions, when they go about it in a way with a little more humility and a little more acceptance. I am passionate about this, but I understand that there are other perspectives. There might be people who value something else, and it's okay. But for those who want to listen, I'd love to share with you what I'm passionate about. Do you feel the difference in that energy? So who reaches their goal? When you chase after your desire with too much desperation, it will remain beyond your grasp. And that's when we get all the negative ones. Opinionated, condescending, self-righteous, intolerant. Do you see how this all comes into play now? Yes. Right? All right, so that was number one. So we'll try to do this by each one, and hopefully your questions will get answered that way. All right, so let's talk about number two, type two. Type two desire is to connect to people. Connection is a very strong word for them. They love to connect to other people, to be needed by others, and to be loved by them. They, yes, everybody wants it, but this is we're talking about what really drives that person, right? So to be needed by others and to be loved by them. Now, because they really like to connect to people, they actually are naturally good at just picking up at what other people need. They'll notice before anyone else, oh, you look tired. Do you need this? Oh, do you need a drink? You know, they notice that. There's a new person in the room. They're the first ones to go over to them. Someone moves into the neighborhood. Can I bring you an apple pie? Actually, they won't ask. They'll just show up with the apple pie. They really are good, generous, kind people who love to help others. They smile a lot. They're just really likable people. So where do we go from that to the dark side, right? So let's say if I'm bringing my neighbor apple pie, she's the new neighbor, and I want to be helpful, and I really also want to feel needed, right? So I tell her, you know, the most amazing supermarket, if you want to get good prices, down that way. You want to fill up gas, this one's open really late. And you're kind of being that person who she needs, right? And then the neighbor starts making, the new neighbor, right, starts making more friends. And you're like, hmm, she might not need me so much anymore. So you get a little possessive of that person. And, you're, and you don't like when she's hanging out with someone else because now I'm not feeling so needed anymore. Or it might come out in a way where someone is maybe involved in chesed and helping people, um, maybe who are going through a difficult time in their life and they're very involved in helping them. And by the way, so twos are such incredible people and you will find them in a lot of helping organizations and doing chesed and things like that. But when it goes over to the dark side, it comes to a point where they're not respecting the other person's boundaries maybe, they're meddling too much, they're pushing their way in when the person is like, no, today I don't need help, we need a little space. Oh, but maybe you do, maybe you do, right? Because they want to get that feeling like, I am so needed, I am indispensable, right? So you see that. So it's the exact same thing. Somebody goes through life and their life's mission is, I want to connect to others. I want to help others. And through that, they will love me and it's going to be wonderful. And when they go about it in that healthy, balanced way, they get there. They really are loved and needed and appreciated. And yet when they chase after this with that desperation that we discussed, it stays beyond their grasp. Type two, right? Let's go to type three. Three's desire to be successful, to, disting to distinguish themselves from others, and to be admired and valued for their achievements. So they really, success is super important to them. They want to 
be successful, they want to look successful, and they're actually really good at it. They're very, it's, it's, um, they're workaholic kind of people, they're very efficient, they get the job done, they're quick, and they just really work hard and, and accomplish in life, right? They get places. And when they do it in a way that they are fine with their success, but they're not trying to keep you from being successful because that might take away a little bit of my spotlight. You see where that can get a little? Either they're there and they want to actualize their own potential and they're supporting everyone else in actualizing their potential because it's super important for them success. Success for themselves, success for others, right? And they're great speakers and great, they, you know, they have wonderful poise. They, they look sophisticated, right? President Obama is someone that many times was given as an example. You know, even when he was poor and didn't have money, you look at pictures where he's younger and in college, this is a person who just naturally had a certain way of carrying himself, and threes do that really well. But when they get to the unhealthy side, because they want to make sure that they're the ones who are successful, it'll be at the price of whatever it takes, right? If I need to step on you, I'll step on you. I need to be dishonest, I'll be dishonest. And that's when we get to all the negative sides. So on a positive side, they're just successful people. They might open organizations, open businesses. Um, they're great at lawyers, because they're great at you know presenting and having that way to to put down a case really well, and they're great at any anything like that. Really, they can be great at anything because they're just so driven. But um, so they can be either the success that inspires everyone around them, or the success that steps on everybody around them. Fours. Okay, so fours is. Um, so this is a little subtle here. So they desire to discover and express their unique, authentic selves to maintain an awareness of their true emotions and to create and find beauty in the world. So it's very important for them. What's so, what, what they want really, I wanna know myself, but I wanna know myself completely. So if I'm feeling an emotion, one second, what was that feeling? You know, I'm so happy today, hmm. Am I completely happy? I'm feeling like a little bit of, maybe I'm, there's a part of me that's a little sad. Why am I sad? One second. And they try to chase down you know, all the different emotions within them. So um, the analogy I like to give for fours is when we imagine water, right? If we want the water to be productive, we channel it, right? We got it, we, we put it into pipes, and then it can irrigate the fields, and it can bring waters to our faucets, and we have waters at home. But when water is not channeled at all, and it can just go wherever, you got a tsunami, you got flooding, you got destructive water, right? So with fours, sometimes because they so badly want to understand every single part of every single little piece in them, they kind of get lost in the water and it's all over the place. And they want to be creative and they want to be artistic and they start the project, but then maybe I feel this and maybe I feel that. And they so badly want to understand themselves, but they get scattered in a million paces. And when they can focus a little, I didn't. What's the good side here? They are incredibly empathetic, creative, inspiring people. And when they, they, when they can channel their emotions a little bit and keep it kind of, um, this is what I'm feeling. Is there another feeling there? Perhaps. I'll look at it later. For now, let me stay focused on this. And then they can accomplish much more. They can express themselves much better. They don't get lost in a million places. And they, they might find, they might be very successful in certain um, artistic pursuits. But otherwise, they get so involved and so consumed in trying to understand every part of themselves that they don't get to, to uh, accomplish and achieve in quite the same way. Okay, so um, that's fours. Very sensitive, the fours. Very sensitive, warm, empathetic, sympathetic, creative people. That's, that's how we would sum them up. Fives, now we'll talk about fives. Fives desire to acquire knowledge and clarity, to understand the world they live in, and to feel competent and secure by staying informed. So fives love knowledge. They're the kid that was gonna take apart, you know, electronics to try to figure out how does it work? How does this work? How does that work? Um, they're, 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 they're inventors, they're scientists, they can be mathematicians. They might be um, great Talmide uh, Chachamim who learn really, really well and really get it. Um, so what happens with a five? So w w one example, I'll show you two ways that the, that the fives can go. So, um, you know, if we look at a five that sometimes they, 
Now this is a positive, you know with everything we always said there's the positive and the negative, right? The fives have this positive part to them that they are very independent thinkers. So if the whole world is saying that the world is flat, right, we're talking about centuries ago and they're going to say, actually this does not make sense to me. And even if the whole world is saying something, they'll want to figure it out for themselves, prove it to themselves, and then they might discover, hey, the world is actually round. So because they are independent thinkers, they can make these kind of discoveries. But sometimes they get so independent in their thinking that, you know, the expression, their brains fall out. It's like they're so convinced that their way is the only way and what they understand it better than everybody else. And it can, and you know, they go off the deep end a little bit. So they can be a little eccentric, even the ones that are really wise and smart, um, because they are kind of lost in their own heads. And they can be someone as, famous and accomplished as Albert Einstein, who, who gave us knowledge that we never had before, or they can be as destructive as someone like um, Ted Kaczynski, I think, is the Unabomber, right? If, if any of you are familiar with his story, brilliant, brilliant man. Um, I think he graduated from college, I think the earliest of anyone from the college, he, whatever, he, brilliant person, but then he believed, you know, he had his beliefs, was very rigid about them, you know, the modern world is changing and, and whatever it was, and he wanted kind of to um, interfere with that, and he was living in, in the woods all on his own and building his bombs, which he did in an incredibly intelligent way, but it kind of went off the other direction. Now, I just want to mention another thing just to show you sometimes that we make stereotypes that are incorrect. So some people might assume that because fives are so intelligent and they're so smart and they can look at things so well, they're probably star students, all of them. It's interesting that with fives, you can't feed them knowledge that they don't understand. They need to understand it. Like someone explained to me, like I was in the third grade and the teacher gave us the times table to memorize. And she's like, you know, memorize this. And three times three, th nine, three times four, twelve. Like, wh wh what is this? She, she just couldn't memorize it. It was like this wall before she didn't know what they're talking about. And then she went home and her brother told her, no, times table, it means that there is three of three. And he literally like explained to her, there's three times this She's like, oh, now I get it. It's like this light bulb went off, and now she was able to memorize the times table. When they don't understand something, it's like a blockage there. They need to understand. So if a child is starting to learn Gemara, for example, and the Rebbe is at a point where he's just, just say after me. You'll understand in a year from now. They get stuck on that. So they might not necessarily always be like, you know, going through school or through yeshiva with flying colors. It might, certain things might be hard for them because they need to understand it in order to really internalize it. So and just putting that out there because sometimes we, you know, we look at a number, we think we get them and you know, so sometimes it actually plays out a little differently. And also because they're such independent thinkers, they don't always fit well into like the, you know, the academic institutions where they might disagree and they want to be independent. And actually the sixes are rather the ones who will be the professors and, you know, because they are in, they, they work better with the system more, where five sometimes need their own space and they don't always want to work within a system. Um, so they could be non-conformist, not always, not necessarily, but that could be part of it. Or it could just be that they have an independent way of approaching anything, anything at all. Like, you, you know, like a factory's, um, you know, doing something a certain way and they come in there and, they're, and everyone's just like, you know, that's the way it's done. And they come and they have this way of looking at things objectively, very independently minded and they're, you know, why is this, this, I think it would work better if you do it the other way. And they can sell, it's a certain mindset, right, right. And they can literally save millions of dollars for a company by coming and doing a little tweak to a system that's in place. And that's because they're coming to it with fresh eyes, right? So this fresh eyes works for them. And like I said, with a kid in school, it might work against them, but you know, that's what's there. Um, so did we explain, so if they, their desire to take knowledge and do it independently their own way, if they take that too far with too much desperation and they don't want to hear input of anybody else, they kind of get stuck on a little 
little knowledge that's available to them instead of taking the knowledge of everyone around them and they actually don't become as knowledgeable as they would want. That's where they go off with a desperation. Okay, sixes, and I know there was some questions about it. Sixes desire to feel secure. Security is super, super important to the sixes. They want to be supported and guided by others to fight against their anxieties and fears and insecurities. Now, sixes need a support system. They're so loyal because this support system, I'm there for you and it's there for me, right? They're also, um, they're very likable because they're very, um, they're very unassuming. They're not trying to lead anyone. They just want to be part of the group. And they're so committed to the group, whether it's the group meaning uh, you know, a company, uh, um, an organization, or a family. They're so, they're the ones who really go all out. You know, someone in the family needs help. They'll be there at night, during the day. Whatever you need, I'm there for you. They're super, super, super loyal. But they also need that support in every way in their life. They need to make a decision. It's like, um, you know, you need a, a village to raise a child. They need a village to make a decision. They need, you know, do you think I should do this? Do you think I should do that? And they have a hard time trusting their inner voice, their, their own inner voice. So when they try, when they chase after this outer security too much, they don't actually end up feeling more secure. They actually become more anxious. Um, so let me just see, we had the six. So that's when they get anxious, fearful, rigid, indecisive, defensive. Those were, th those were the things. So typically, they're so likable and warm, persevering, helpful, because they're so devoted to the group. But, but sometimes they're their need to get the security from the outside leads them to have all that anxiety on the inside. And by the way, the rigidness is really also, it gives them a sense of security, right? If I do laundry every week the same day, or I put my kids to sleep in a certain, um, following a certain pattern every single night, right? When things are very rigid, it feels more secure. So it's, security is the strong thing for them. All right, seven. Sevens want to be stimulated by new ideas, people, experiences to maintain their freedom and happiness to avoid pain and deprivation. Sevens love life and they love to live life and they love to experience life and they just want to have, they don't want to ever feel stifled. Um, they don't even know there's a sign outside of the zoo. Oh, there was a sign there? Like, I didn't even know it's there, right? They just want to live and embrace every experience that they can have. Um, and they want to avoid pain and deprivation. So what happens sometimes is that there might be painful parts to their life, things that need to be addressed, but instead of taking care of them, they would rather avoid them, distract themselves with another fun outing, and the problem kind of grows and grows and grows. They're the kinds who won't go to the dentist when they're feeling a little something on the tooth. They're, by the time they go to the dentist, you need a root canal. You know that? So. <laughs> right. And again, I just want to say, that, that doesn't mean that everybody who does this is a seven. It's just an analogy to understand the bigger picture, what we're talking about, and how chasing after the desire of that happiness can result in that. All right, eights. Um, eights desire to protect themselves, to be independent, to resist weakness, to make things happen, to stay in control of every situation. Now, some people look at eights, and because they're so direct and so loud a little bit sometimes, um, you know, and they think like they're controlling, they want to control. And in fact, not all, you know, some eights like to feel like in control, like managing a team or whatever. But for most eights, the thing is more about feeling in control of a situation. What I mean by that is that they will want to arrive to the airport an hour earlier than you have to because they don't want to ever, let's say if they're going to the airport because they don't ever want to feel like they're scrambling and they're grabbing things and they don't know what's going on they always have to feel like the situation is under control you know they might be ready for Shabbos uh, like very punctually very they don't like to ever feel like something is everything's flying they, they need to feel a situation is under control um, Right, they like to be independent. They don't like taking orders from anyone. Um, and again, I gave the, I you know, I, I gave this example of the mother bear before because some people can look at them and feel like they're so direct and they're so strong, but really they're also incredibly loyal and very protective. If you were raised by a eight father, you know, 
No one ever dare start up with you because your father is going to come running and stick up for you. You know that? Um, so, and, and if you have like an aide in your life, you know they're a little scary sometimes, but when one, you need someone on your team, you want that person, right? Okay. Um, and by the way, another important thing to know if you are dealing with aides. So very many times, because aides are so direct and maybe even sometimes a little abrupt. So they're like, so you know, the employee comes over to them and says, can I talk to you about something? Yes, make it quick, what do you need? And the person's like, um, well, yesterday, we're at, we're at, right? The more you beat around the bush, the more nervous they become. You want to deal well with an aide, just be direct. They are honest people, they are fair, but you got to be direct with them. They, they'll be direct with you, you be direct with them, and then the relationship will be amazing. Right. Okay. Um, nines. Nines desire to. Oh, one minute. Did I explain how we go from wanting to protect themselves to not reaching their desire? Um, right. So they can kind of get a little. Um, too, they can take this too far, where they don't ever want to be vulnerable, never show their vulnerabilities to anybody. I'm going to take care of everything myself. They start not trusting anyone, and instead of feeling like things are in control, they're starting to feel that things are not in control, and I'm not, be because they're so much trying to protect themselves, they're not leaning on anybody, they're not trusting anybody, so it kind of becomes like a vicious cycle where they're not trusting and not feeling secure, so I want to feel in control, so I'll do this, but then I feel less in control. It starts messing in their heads where they want control so much and then it always seems to be beyond them. All right, nines. My book, yes. <laughs> it has some notes inside. But, um, okay, so nines. What's nines? Nines desire to create harmony in their environment, to avoid conflict, and to be at peace. They are the ultimate peacemakers. Whatever you want, I'll give you. They're very easy to have around, very easy to please. They smile a lot. From the outside, you might confuse them with twos, because they also are like, they, they, they're positive and smiling. But, they're, um, but twos are a little more extroverted, typically. And with twos, it's more about giving and connecting. And nines are sometimes, you know, just leave me in my own space, in my own bubble. They, they're very imaginative. They might also be very artistic, because they, um, you know, they can get lost in their imaginary world. As a kid, they might like to daydream, um, things like that. So they want to create harmony in their environment to avoid conflict. OK, so nines is super important. How do they go about, I want to pursue harmony, right? I, I want to have harmony in my environment, so I'm never going to ruffle any feathers. How does that get to not having any peace? So here's what happens. The nine is at work, and they're being taken advantage of, and they're asked to do something that's maybe not part of their job description, or even like inappropriate, like you don't ask this worker to do that. But they're like, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, so I'm going to go and do it. And then it happens again and again, and they end up, because they so badly want everybody to be at peace and everything to be good, they don't speak up when they need to speak up. And then they don't have inner peace because the things that needed to get fixed, by the time they address it, it became this whole big deal, right? So, um, and this happens in relationships, right? Maybe someone, um, you know, the spouse is doing something that really bothers them, but let's have peace in the house, so I'm not going to say anything. And then, you know, they start having this inner resentment that's growing and growing. Now, for a long time, they'll stay in avoidance. Um, nines and sevens have similar coping mechanisms where they love to do the avoiding thing, right? But sevens are much more uh, um, outgoing and spunky and loud, and nines are quieter. But nines also do like to avoid things, so they could be in a relationship, something could bother them, and they're just going to keep pushing off. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. But then at the end of the day, they don't end up having a more peaceful existence. Exactly the opposite. They get so agitated and, and upset. You think it's easier, like every time I came to a number, I was like, oh, that's me, but come on, I'm not all nine. <laughs> right, I mean, right, right. Well, surely I sound very pompous if I think I'm all nine. But I think it would be easier if somebody who knows me very well, let's say a spouse, would pick what I am. Right. Because I don't believe that I could be... No, no. So that's why I said that as a disclaimer in the beginning, that because we're going to do kind of an overview, I can guarantee that you'll all figure out your types. But hopefully you get a little glimpse about it. And, you know, if it's something that fascinates you, you can always read more. But
Sometimes, sometimes. I'll tell you, sometimes a person is going to base it just on the description, on the what, and not on the why. But they, but they might give you a good idea. Like, if, if I know somebody, like, I can tell them, you know, it's going to be one of these two or three, but you know what drives you. So at the end of the day, you know, you'll know the answer. But they could help you narrow it down. But the why is the super important piece here. Yes, that's a great question. There's tons written about it. Um, I'm trying to remember if I included it in my book, and I actually don't at the moment. Um, I don't remember if I included, but but in general, there is it's a whole other fascinating piece to talk about. <laughs> right, right. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, however you pair it up. It's always, what will the work be? There's always going to be work. It just might be a little different. Like if someone is exactly the same as you and you understand each other perfectly, you might get stuck in, on the same things and not grow together. And if someone's different, you're kind of being pushed to grow in that direction. All right, let's move on to um, principle three. All right, this is a good one. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is really super, super important. Principle three. So, can, can I take your question after in case it gets answered? Okay. Um, so principle three, what I want you first to do is write down on your, in your notebook. We're not yet writing on the sheet. In your notebook. Well, uh, we did it the last time. I always want to try to be right. What do you do that? We did. Um, <laughs> okay, soon. I am so, I am so blank. And this could be anything related to your personality, positive, negative, neutral, whatever you want. I'm so shy, I'm so patient, I'm so whatever you want. I'm so blank, therefore blank. I'm so blank. I am so blank, any, any trait, therefore however you want to finish the sentence. I am so shy, therefore whatever. I am so patient, therefore whatever. I'm so outgoing, I'm so lazy. Negative, positive, doesn't matter. Just finish the sentence. I am so blank, a personality trait, and finish it. All right. The third. Now, I want you to look at the statement. Did, raise your hand if you finished writing it. You have your statement down? I'm so blank, therefore blank, right? Okay, look at your statement. And I want you to see, did you finish your statement in a way that empowers you or that limits you? All right. Principle number three. And can you see, however you finished it, However you finished it, can you see that you potentially could finish it either way? Right? You could finish it either way. I could say, I could say, I am so shy, therefore, I don't like going to weddings and events. Limit, right? Or I could say, I am shy, so I try to find a friend to accompany me so I can attend weddings and events in a way that's enjoyable. Right? So let's, that brings us to principle number three. And this principle is actually the idea behind the title of my book and the idea behind the title of today's. Can I have my book back for one second? <laughs> so I, I wanted to title my book out of the box. And I have that picture there of people, figures, climbing out of a box. And the point of this was, I know that there are people who don't appreciate personality systems. And the reason is that most of them find them very limiting. You're telling me that this is what I am? Like, why limit myself in that kind of way, right? Uh -huh. But the point is the person, personality system is here to give you knowledge. What you do with that knowledge, that's your choice. You can use that knowledge to limit you. And I tell this to people all the time. Your job is not to become the poster child of your type. Oh, I'm seven, I'm scatterbrained, I'll, let me make sure to stay scatterbrained forever. Your job is to take this knowledge and now you can set your compass. Where is north, where is south, 
Where do I need to go? How do I actualize the strong points of my type? And what do I need to do to overcome the drawbacks that come along with my type? And that's the point of out of the box. You take knowledge that you have about yourself. Your self-knowledge should be there to help build you and empower you. And yes, you should change. You don't have to stay the way you're being described forever. If you are an evolving person, you will have evolved, right? You don't, it's not like you, that's your personality type and that's what, that is your starting point of your journey and please, go, <laughs> don't stay here. So I want to, so for principle three, you can put this on your paper is, principle number three, use self-knowledge to empower you not to limit you. Use self-knowledge to empower you, not to limit you. Thank you. Yes. So when we think of labels, we usually think of them negatively, right? Why give myself a label? So the labels aren't necessarily bad. Labels reflect awareness. You can look in the mirror honestly and say, this is uh, this is me. I, I am shy. I am disorganized. You know, I'm rigid sometimes. That's just the way I am. But the, prob the problem isn't having that awareness and kind of labeling yourself with that. The problem is when this self-knowledge limits you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right? So that's the principle number three. We're using our self-knowledge to empower you, not to limit you. So now you learned something about yourself. What are you going to do with that knowledge? Right? Um, so like in my book, I have a few specific like affirmations for every type that this is how you can grow with these affirmations. But the Enneagram system in general, and this is a very, very fascinating part of the Enneagram, and I'm going to show that to you now. Um, Yes. Um, so what, what the Enneagram system has is what it calls the path of growth, okay? The path of self-growth. And basically what that is, it kind of predicts that if this type is going to change, if they're going to climb out of the box the way we just described, where does it need to go to? What types traits does it need to um, you know, need to get integrated a little bit. Of course, it won't become that type. That's why some of you were saying you see yourself for more than one number. So you don't have to become that type, but if you can integrate some of that type's traits, then you will be an evolving person. You will not have stayed stuck. The way we said, we don't want to stay stuck within the type. We want to expand from it. So I'll very briefly explain the um, direction of growth. You see, I have a symbol down there that says direction of growth with arrows. If you can look at that, I'll quickly go through them to explain it. We'll start with number one. One is typically, you know, very responsible and serious about their passions, right? They need to change the world. There's a lot of work to do. They're serious about it. When one grows to seven, remember we said sevens were these fun-loving, spontaneous type. They go about their passions in a more lighthearted way. And then the way we described earlier, people are more likely to um, be receptive of what they have to say. Sevens grow. So, so it's not like you have to become a seven, right? You don't have to become a seven. You're going to integrate some positive qualities of that number. Seven. Sevens, as you see, grow towards five. Now, sevens are a little scatterbrained and all over the place, and they want to have variety in their life. They're the kind of people who don't want to have a one necklace that costs $10,000. They want to have 20 that cost a little because they want to change it up every day. Why not? Let's enjoy, right? So they love for variety. They can be all over the place. They like, you know, they want to have fun. Um, but sometimes they're too all over the place. And five were the ones who were super focused. Remember the focused fives, the um, investigators. So sevens go to five. Now they're never going to become five. They, don't, they won't become the hermits on top of the mountains who want to live alone. They're not going to spend five hours in a lab trying to dissect something. But they will get a little focus in their life. That's how they grow. If they use their self-knowledge to empower them and not to limit them, they won't say, oh, I'm scatterbrain, but they will figure out how to bring some focus into their life. Um, so that's the seven to five. Where do they go to five? Have some traits of five. No, no, no. What we're saying is that if a person, the way we said, they don't want to use their self-knowledge to limit themselves. They want to empower themselves and they want to grow. So if you want to know, so how do I grow? 
the, the number that's there is going to give you a clue to what does your self-growth journey begin with. What do you need to begin your journey? So sevens go to five, they get more focused, right? Um, by the way, another fun thing that I want to mention about sevens. Sevens are great at starting things. They Starting things. Like, for example, there's a community. Somebody needs to make a yeshiva, right? And now, when we sit and think, make a yeshiva, how am I going to pay the teachers? Where am I going to find a building? How am I going to recruit students? Like, there's so much there. Sevens just jump in and they open it. But then they can't keep it running so well. So eventually, other people step in and take over, right? So sevens are very good at jumping in with stuff. All right, five. Now, fives like we said they're in their heads a lot they're figuring things out they're analyzing the world around them but sometimes they need to be a little more proactive and a little more um, the eights are pure action eights get things done they're the action people and fives are the thinking people and sometimes they're too much in their heads so five going to eight means that they get some of the action seven and eights are the two most like people that have the most presence no, so it's the eight that gives them that movement. All right, eight when eight grows. Now, eights try sometimes too hard to protect themselves. They want to make sure nobody is stabbing them in the back. They want to make sure they're never vulnerable, right? So when eights grow to two, they allow themselves to get a little vulnerable and start trying to connect more with others and not be in that self-protective mode, but in more generous mode. So that's how eight grows to two. Now, two to four, this one is a really good one. So, number, four, number twos. Twos are really good at knowing what everybody needs. They're really, really good, always, at knowing what everybody needs, how to help everybody. They're not so good at being honest with themselves about what they need, right? They tend to have a hard time saying no because they don't know how to set boundaries and be honest with themselves that I can't do this, this is too much. And they're so tuned into what everybody else needs, they sometimes need to look inside themselves, what do I need here? And that's why twos grow to fours, because fours have amazing self-awareness, and twos could use a little bit of that sometimes. Just follow the arrows. And then four to one. So fours, we said, can get lost in their emotional world sometimes, and when they go to one, that gives them self-discipline. Ones are very self-disciplined, very purposeful, and that's what the fours could use sometimes. Now, there's still a triangle in the middle, Right? So that's the, th the nine to three to six. To so let's start from the three. The three goes to six. Yeah, two goes to, yeah. Let's, it's, you follow the lines? Yes, five more, um, yes, five more minutes, okay. Um, so then we have the triangle inside, so the three. Um, the three is the leaders, they want their own success. When they go to six, they're a little bit more committed to the group, right? And not just their own success. Six has a lot of anxiety. When they go to nine, they're living with a little more peace of mind. And nines, the easygoing ones, sometimes too lazy, sometimes too laid back. When they go to three, they get that extra push, the motivation that they need. So the Enneagram, the lines inside the Enneagram are kind of there to clue us in, where does my growth journey begin, right? Okay, we didn't get to the last part. The last part is our concluding piece. The concluding piece, what? Yes. She has one on this too, yeah. All right, so let's talk about the closing idea. Um, I was going to do an exercise for this, but if we're running short in time, should I skip the exercise and just wrap it up? Okay. Okay, right. Okay, so let's go straight to the idea. Um, Okay, um, the closing idea is it's very important to understand that when we look at all the desires that we discussed, right, all these different desires that drive the person and motivate them, really what they sometimes are, they sometimes are our own, down? Okay, what the, all these um, desires that we have, what they often really are, they are our defense mechanisms to, that we tell ourselves 
that this makes me lovable. Let me explain what I mean. Yes, I'll say it one more time. The idea is that we have these desires that drive us and they're a good thing, right? They get us to do what we do in our life. They give our life purpose and meaning and they focus us in on what we want to accomplish in our life and that is good. However, it's important to understand that very many times our desire is there as a defense mechanism that we use to tell ourselves that I am lovable. Number one says, I am lovable because I'm so good, right? Number two says, I'm so lovable because I'm so generous and kind and helpful. Number three says, I'm so lovable because I'm, I, 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 I achieve, I have successes. Number four says, I'm so lovable because I'm so unique. Right? They're always trying to figure out their themselves, their identity. So I, I'm so unique and that's what makes me lovable. Number five might say I'm so lovable because I have so much amazing knowledge. Number six might say I'm so lovable because of all that I contribute to my social circle and to my group. I'm such a loyal member of wherever I go and that's what makes me deserving and lovable. And number seven maybe is getting a little stuck on even thinking about am I lovable or not. They're so busy distracting themselves so they don't even go there. And number eight, well I'm so strong and I get things done and that's why I'm valuable and lovable and deserving. And number nine, I don't ruffle any feathers. I'm so easy to have around. Everybody's, you know, why shouldn't I be loved, right? It's like a defense mechanism of, of each number. What? Right. Right. So now, the important idea that I want you to write down is I am already loved. If we can have this concept, I am already loved. When you go about chasing your desire, but you're coming from a place where you know, I am valuable, I am loved. Hashem loves me exactly the way I am. I am a unique neshama. There's no one like me in the world. No one can ever take my place. I'm already this amazing, unique person that Hashem loves so much. Then I can go after my desire, but I'm coming from a place of expansiveness. I'm coming with an open-hearted way and then that desperation that we discussed earlier is not there, right? But as long as we're chasing after it to prove to ourselves, I'm so good, so I'm loved, I'm so kind, so, I'll be, so I can be loved, right? Then the desperation is there and that's when you get into that chase that we discussed. So just to keep that at the forefront always, I am already loved, I'm already a holy neshama that Hashem loves, I'm already an amazing person, and this is, my desire is just what gives me purpose and meaning in my life, but I don't need the desperation because I don't need to prove anything to myself. That's, that's that's the idea. All right. Thank you. So, thank you.